All right, so today, let's do a deep dive into something we all think about, probably more than we'd like to admit money. And no, not about like, what's the latest stock tip, but more like, why do we think about money the way we do? Have you ever noticed how some people just, I don't know, seem to have this knack for it? While others, even if they're like really good with numbers, they still stress over every penny. Yeah, absolutely. And it's not always about being good or bad with money, is it? Exactly. So we're diving deep into the psychology of money today. We're using Morgan Housel's book, The Psychology of Money, as a starting point. And we're also going to be drawing on this really insightful YouTube video by escaping ordinary... They have some really cool takes on this. Oh, yeah. BC Marks, he's got a knack for making these financial concepts really relatable. Totally. So think of this deep dive as like uncovering those hidden factors that shape our financial lives, you know? It's more than just interest rates and spreadsheets, right? Exactly. It's about understanding your own, and I love this term, financial DNA. Financial DNA, I like that. Right. So it's not like actual DNA, but almost more powerful, you know? Yeah. It's that money mindset we kind of inherit from our upbringing, our experiences. Things you think like, what were the money conversations like in your house growing up? Totally. Were your parents savers or spenders? Mm -hmm. Did you experience like times of abundance or scarcity? This really hit home for me in that YouTube video, by the way. They talked about how people born in different decades, they just view the stock market, inflation, everything so differently. Oh, for sure. Like someone who lived through the boom of the 70s versus, say, the uncertainty of the 50s. Exactly. Their financial instincts are like shaped by totally different worlds. And that's the thing, isn't it? These early experiences, sometimes we barely even remember them, but they become this kind of financial autopilot influencing our decisions without us even realizing it. It's like inheriting a financial instinct. Sometimes it's great. Sometimes yeah. not so much. Exactly. So think about your own money origin story for a second, you know. What were those early experiences? Even if they seem small or insignificant now, they might be shaping your financial decisions more than you realize. So we've talked about that financial DNA, right? <laughs> but there's this other biggie that both Housel and Escaping Ordinary really hammered home compounding. And I got to admit, this one, this one kind of blew my mind a little bit, you know? It's one of those things that sounds simple on the surface, but when you really grasp it, it's pretty powerful. Totally. It's not just about like making money. It's about making money on the money you've already made. Like imagine a snowball, right? Rolling down a hill just keeps picking up more and more snow. It's exponential growth and it's the key to building wealth over time. Exactly. And the best part, time is your biggest ally with this whole compounding thing. The YouTube video, they had this amazing example with Warren Buffett, you know, the Oracle of Omaha. Oh yeah, he's like the poster child for long-term investing. Right. And they pointed out how he started investing when he was, get this, 10 years old. 10. Wow, talk about starting young. I know, right? By the time he was 30, he was already a millionaire. Obviously, the guy's a genius investor, but even so, that early start gave his money decades to compound. Decades is the key word there. That's a lot of snow on that snowball. Totally. And they even compared him to Jim Simons, this hedge fund manager with these insane annual returns. But Simons started investing way later in life. So even though his returns were higher, he had less time on his side. Exactly. The YouTube video actually crunched the numbers. They said if Simons had started at the same age as Buffet, even with those amazing returns, his net worth would be, well, basically unimaginable. It really underscores how powerful that early start can be. Like, it's almost never too early to start investing, even if it's just a small amount. Because time is the magic ingredient. It's the multiplier that makes all the difference. And that's something to keep in mind, especially when you feel tempted to, I don't know, try to time the market or chase those get rich quick schemes. Yeah. Oh, totally. Speaking of which, let's talk about another thing that can really trip us up when it comes to money. Our tendency towards, shall we say, pessimism. Ah, yes. Our brains are wired to focus on the negative. It's a survival mechanism, but not always helpful in finance. Seriously, the YouTube video called us out on this big time. Like, we fixate on market crashes, recessions, all the scary stuff. Mm. But we often miss the slow, steady progress happening in the background. Just like that old saying, no news is good news. 
but our brains crave the drama. Right. It's like we're hardwired for those dramatic headlines, you know. And while it's important to be aware of potential risks, letting that negativity bias control your financial decisions can lead to some, shall we say, less than optimal outcome. For sure. Like selling everything when the market dips, even though historically it's always bounced back. Or being so afraid of risk that you miss out on potential growth. Exactly. It's about finding that balance, yeah. right? Acknowledging the risks, but not letting them paralyze you. Because... In the grand scheme of things, long-term trends tend to be positive, even with a few bumps along the way. It's about playing the long game, remembering that slow and steady wins the race. And sometimes that requires tuning out the noise and focusing on the bigger picture. It's like we're so focused on the negative, we forget that luck, both good and bad, is always part of the equation, you know? And speaking of luck, the YouTube video, it actually told this story about Bill Gates that really got me thinking about this whole luck versus skill thing. Oh, yeah. What was that about? So apparently Gates had this crazy opportunity in high school to use a supercomputer. A supercomputer. Uh -huh. Back then, that's practically unheard of. Right. Total luck, right place, right time. And it ended up playing this huge role in him, you know, creating Microsoft and everything. Talk about a lucky break. I know. But here's the thing. The video also talks about this friend of Gates's, Ken Evans, super brilliant guy, just as into computers as Gates. Okay. Tragically, Evans died young, mountaineering accident. Oh, wow. And it just, it made me think like both of them in a way experience these one in a million events. You know, one leads to incredible success, the other, well, tragedy. It really puts things in perspective, doesn't it? Like, no matter how much we plan, how hard we work, there's always this element of chance of the unknown. Totally. Like, we can't control everything. Exactly. And I think that's a really important thing to remember, especially when it comes to something like investing. Because we can get so caught up in trying to control every little thing, trying to predict the market. When in reality, the best we can do is make informed decisions, manage our risk, and be prepared for whatever comes our way. Be ready for those lucky breaks and the curveball. Exactly. It's about being adaptable, being resilient. It's like that saying, luck favors the prepared. Exactly. And that reminds me of this analogy Morgan Housel uses in his book. He compares investing to, get this, wanting a car. Wanting a car. Okay, I'm intrigued. How so? So he says you can buy new, you can buy used, or you can try to steal one. Okay. Definitely not recommending that last option. Right. But each option has its own, like, risks and rewards. Buying new, that's like aiming for those high returns, knowing there will be volatility. But you're in it for the long haul. Makes sense. What about used? Used is more about stability. Maybe lower returns, but less risk. You're okay with a bit less flash for a smoother ride. Got it. And what about the stealing option? Well, Housel says that's like trying to time the market chasing quick wins without accepting that there's going to be risk, there's going to be volatility. It's trying to game the system. Exactly. And it rarely ends well. So it's about accepting the price of admission, right? Understanding that there are no shortcuts to success in investing. Exactly. It takes patience, resilience, and being comfortable with a little bit of uncertainty. No get-rich-quick schemes here. Definitely not. It's no. about building a solid strategy, managing risk, and letting time work its magic. And you know what? That actually ties into another big theme from both the book and the video, the difference between being rich and being wealthy. Yeah. Because they're not always the same, are they? No, not at all. I loved how the YouTube video illustrated this. They said, richness is what you see, wealth is what you don't see. Oh, that's good. Like, richness is the fancy cars, the big house, the stuff yeah. that screams, look at me. Exactly. But wealth, it's more subtle. It's the assets you're building the financial security, the freedom to live life on your own terms. The peace of mind. Exactly. It's about having enough and knowing what enough means for you. Because it's different for everyone, right? For some people, it's about early retirement. For others, it's about being able to pursue their passions without worrying about money. It's about aligning your finances with your values, with the life you want to live. So we've talked about a lot today, financial DNA, the power of compounding, our tendency towards negativity, the role of luck, and of course, the big one, the difference between being rich and being truly wealthy. But I think it all comes back to this idea of understanding the psychology of money. You know, it's not just about numbers in a bank account. It's about understanding those hidden scripts, those emotional factors that influence how we think about money and how we manage it. Because once you understand those factors, you can start to make more intentional choices.
choices that are aligned with your values and your goals. Exactly. So as you go about your week, think about what we talked about today. What does financial freedom, what does true wealth look like to you, and what steps can you take, even small ones, to start building that future? Food for thought.